Well, hello, everyone. Welcome um, to this evening, to this um, launch of Quentin Skinner's new book, From Humanism to Hobbes. It's a great pleasure and a privilege um, to be here with Quentin. Um, when I was reading the book, there's a lot of Shakespeare in the book, and when I was reading the book, I was thinking of what I would say to introduce him, and this line kept on coming back to me from Julius Caesar, which was Cassius's line. Um, he says, why, man, this is him talking about Caesar, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs. <laughs> now, I am not saying <laughs> that you are anything like Caesar. I mean, um, you hate Caesar. You hate everything that Caesar stands for. But nonetheless, what you are is a colossus in the history of political thought. Um, to introduce Quentin, um, Quentin taught at the University of Cambridge um, from 1962 to 2008. He was appointed as Professor of Political Science in 1979 and then as Regius Professor of History in 1996. He then came to Queen Mary as the Barbara Bowman Professor of the Humanities in 2008 and he has held visiting appointments all over the world, most recently last year in Chicago and Peking. He holds honours from all over the world as well, including honorary doctorates, just for example, from the universities of Athens, Oxford and Harvard. He has won all the relevant prizes, uh, such as the Balzan Prize and the Wolfson Prize for his writing and research, and also um, at Cambridge, the Pilkington Prize for his extraordinary teaching. He is also a fellow of all the learned societies that might be relevant and was elected to a fellowship of the British Academy in 1981. Now, with regard to his publications, um, we all have to say now that we are outstanding in our field, uh, but he really is outstanding in his field. Um, in his writings, as we all know, on both method and also early modern uh, political thought, and in particular thinking about the texts of Machiavelli, Shakespeare, Hobbes and Milton. He is the author of no fewer than 14 books, beginning with the foundations of modern political thought in 1978, itself foundational to our discipline of the history of political thought. He has published articles that I really couldn't actually count. I mean, I couldn't count how many there were, but most recently he has um, published Climate Change in the Light of the Past um, in a new... Um, book edited by Sophie Smith and Katrina Forrester, and many of his articles are classics um, and have, been, have defined the field. He's also the editor of 17 books, and so you can start to see why this line from Cassius kept, referring to, kept recurring to me and why we might all think of ourselves in relation as petty men. Um, now, what is going to happen uh, this evening is that I'm going to interview Quentin um, for about half an hour um, and then um, we're all going to go and drink um, and celebrate the book um, and Quentin is going to be available to sign copies um, of the book at a discount of 20%, I believe, so that's a brilliant deal. Um, I should say that a very long time ago now, I was supervised by Quentin um, when he used to ask the questions of me. Well, now the tables have turned. And, um, but if he had been a different kind of supervisor, um, I might, of course, use this occasion to enact a kind of revenge. But um, Quentin was the very best teacher, intuitive, liberating, supportive. Um, and so there's going to be no stabbing in the back um, this evening. Um, and it's That's only going to be the greatest pleasure um, to uh, let Quentin adumbrate the themes of his dazzling new book. So to turn um, to the book. The book is a collection of essays, um, and it um, is interested in a number of various themes, but running through the book um, is an argument that he has adumbrated throughout his work, really, which is an argument about... Um, the fact that you cannot hope to understand historical texts unless you understand the discursive contexts into which those texts 
are intended to intervene. And the specific context that Quentin is interested in in this book is the context of humanism. And so what I'd like to start by doing is asking you, Quentin, what is it that we learn more about these texts um, through our understanding of the humanistic context? Mm. Well, that is the right question to ask indeed. Um, well, humanism for me is the name of a, a syllabus, uh, the Studia Humanitatis, a five-part syllabus, uh, grammar, rhetoric, history, um, poetry, moral philosophy. What's critical to me in this book is that it has, as you say, four heroes, giant names, uh, Machiavelli um, and Shakespeare and Milton and Hobbes. All of them had this education. Now, we all know that education is formative, and Shakespeare was the one who uh, did not uh, go to university, um, but if you went to a grammar school, you learnt the Latin language. Uh, that's why they were called grammar schools, you learnt Latin grammar, and then you learnt rhetoric in the sixth form. So he had the foundations of a humanistic education, and the rest continued at university to um, study classical um, uh, history uh, and philosophy in greater detail. So it's the name of a syllabus which generates a particular way of thinking about argument as well. Uh, and that's important for me, not just because Hobbes to some degree repudiates it, but that you really have no chance of understanding much of what's going on in Machiavelli and indeed in Shakespeare, I venture to claim in this book, if you don't understand that within humanism, the fundamental um, discipline was the Ars Rhetorica. Uh, and rhetoric was the name, not as it would be now, for um, a way of ornamenting our discourse with figures and tropes of speech, but was a theory of argumentation. And so, as well as ornamentation, and before that, there comes invention and disposition. And this is the optimal way to organize a persuasive argument. What I try to show in the book is the number of texts at which you can understand why they have their vocabulary, why they have their organization and their structure, if and only if you realize that they're examples of rhetorical performances. So, can I ask you to um, maybe exemplify that? But, um, and maybe, if you'd like, to think about the trial of Shylock? Oh, yes, all right. Well, um, in the essay that I have in the book, Shylock appears as someone in court, so the, the kind of rhetoric we're talking about here is the genus judiciale, the, the genus of judicial rhetoric, which was mm. the main one that the classical rhetoricians were interested in. So the first thing you have to understand there is that you come into court, you have to have a particular quaestio or causa, a cause, as we would say, in mind, and the constitution of your cause will be of one of three kinds. And it could be to do with a, a, um, the explanation of a fact, that would be a conjectural cause, that's not relevant to the case you've asked me to speak of, mm. but it could be that there's a question about a legal text, that's why you're in court, and that would be called legalis, and it turns out that that's what's the issue. But to start with, that's not the issue in Shylock's trial, because he comes forward with the claim that his plea is jurisdictional. Um, I mean, that's a very confusing piece of vocabulary, but that's what the rhetoricians call it. And he comes into court with the claim that he has a juridical cause which is absolute. That's to say he has a legal contract. Now, Cicero says, if you find yourself in court with someone who has a legal contract, then wh why are you in court? <laughs> you haven't got a chance. Mm. The only thing you can do is say, well, I haven't got a case, but I plead for mercy. Now, in the interpretation of this great scene, it's been very common in the literature to say, well, Portia's plea for mercy is one of the great moments, even in Shakespeare, mm. but it's, as one commentator says, it's a grand irrelevance. Why are we listening to this? Well, because she doesn't have a case, and the rhetoricians say, if you don't have a case, that's called assumptive, something has to be added. All you can do is plead for mercy. So that's the first thing she does. Then it occurs to her, actually, there is also a, a case which is legalis here. There's a contract. So she says, pray let me look upon the bond. And the whole scene unfolds in a new way. So I'll be as quick as I can in saying that what then unfolds is what's characteristic of a legal case, which is you may have a good case in law, but the thing you have to understand, and here's Cicero again, is, is there a lex contraria? Is there a contrary law which is of superior standing to yours? So, for example, is there a public law which would supervene upon a private contract? 
The crucial fact about the scene is that, Sh that Shylock hasn't thought of that possibility. But there is a contrary law. And his great moment of collapse is when the contrary law is quoted to him by Portia and he says, is that the law? Critically, there's something he doesn't know. Now, all of this requires that you understand the, the rhetorical structure of the scene. It follows it to the letter. And this is important in my essay because the crux of the scene has usually been taken to be when um, Portia says, uh, and I've looked at the bond, it says flesh but no blood. And so critics have commonly said, the tables are turned, he can't have his contract after all. But of course he can. And the next thing that Portia says is, take then thy bond, take, thy pound of, take then thy pound of flesh, it is a pentameter. Mm. Um, but there's a contrary law, which says that if you spill the blood of a Christian in Venice, you forfeit half your goods. So that's the crux of the scene. He didn't know the lex contraria. Mm. So it's nothing to do with um, uh, the fact that it's flesh but not, uh, mm. but not blood. But the lex contraria, which Portia, we have to assume, has guessed, will mean he doesn't enforce the contract because he would forfeit half his goods. None of that comes clear to you unless you understand mm. the exact structure of the scene, which is entirely taken from the discussion in Cicero's De Inventione of how to invent, i.e. find out how to conduct a case in law. Thank you. Um, another feature of um, the rhetorical tradition that you excavate that I found very arresting um, and that you explored as well in your previous book on Hobbes and uh, reason and rhetoric is this extraordinary kind of moral scepticism that mm. the art of rhetoric seems to um, unfold. So there's a great emphasis, as you point out, um, in arguing in utramque partem, yes. the idea that every dispute is open to, um, that there are two sides to everything. Um, and also, of course, the figure, which you're very interested in, um, of paradiastole, yes. the idea that virtues might be redescribed as vices and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and I wonder to what extent you think that that constitutes an alternative moral philosophy? Mm. I think I would more want to say that it constitutes a huge question for moral philosophy. Right. And that was understood very early in antiquity because the first great author, and it has an extraordinary impact, who takes up exactly this question is Thucydides in book three of the histories where he talks about Stasis and Corsara. And he says the first casualty, if you like, of uh, civil strife, Stasis, is that when words are used to describe actions, I'm here quoting Jeremy Minot's wonderful new translation, um, the values get reversed. And so what is obviously a vice, uh, for, I mean, Thucydides' ex own example is pure audacity, which is um, recklessness and therefore the name of a vice, gets re-described as courage, which is the name of one of the, the cardinal mm. virtues. Conversely, there could be um, obvious virtues, and Thucydides' example is prudence, which get redescribed for, for Anesis mm. and practical wisdom, gets redescribed as cowardice. Mm. Now, this is picked up, of course, in Plato's Republic in Book 8, where he says, well, you know, here is the degeneration of the soul. Uh, how are we to cope with this? And then, fatally, it is theorised by Aristotle in the rhetoric, who says, well, you can take advantage of this. Don't think the vices and virtues are opposite. Some of them are. Justice is the opposite of injustice. But most vices and virtues are neighbours. And so you can always hope to redescribe some virtues as vices and some vices as virtues. So there's a huge challenge to the moralist. What is going to be your answer to this? And the rhetoricians, of course, revel in the difficulties that this raises for moral philosophy. But what that suggests is that there's this sort of fixed moral world out there, and that the question is whether we name it properly. But what do you suggest yes. in um, your interpretation, for example, of um, Coriolanus, yes. is that there might be a real question as to the sort of ontological moral status of Coriolanus. That's yeah. to say, is he noble or is he viciously proud? Yeah, absolutely. And that might be unclear. That's to say, there might not be a truth out there which, yes. might, which language might pick out. That's exactly the point. Uh, and that's what I mean by saying there's a challenge to moral philosophy. Right. Because usually the assumption of the rhetoricians, who are a little bit embarrassed by the extraordinary power, the epistemological power yes. of this trope that they have, 
um, is to say, well, this can be quite readily resolved because everyone can distinguish recklessness from courage. But Aristotle is there to say, oh, really? <laughs> is, is that so obvious? And there it is in the rhetoric, and, and that filters into from Aristotle's rhetoric into the Roman tradition, where this is picked up, especially by Quintilian, in a very big way. Quintilian doesn't suggest that there isn't an answer, but he doesn't tell us what it is. And moral philosophy has had to offer examples, I mean, answers which would deal with these examples. Mm. And I suppose the, the first is Hobbes's attempt, which is to say, well, of course, morality must deal with the virtues and vices, but what you have to go is to motivation. And that's Hobbes's proposal in Leviathan. If you go to the motives of someone, um, then you'll be able to clarify whether the action that they performed was an instance of virtue or not. And of course, the standard motive for Hobbes would be desiring peace. Mm. And if the action that looks reckless is desirous of peace, then it's courage. But of course, a much more radical answer later in the um, Anglophone moral philosophical tradition is to say, look, we've gone the wrong way with the structure of a moral theory. It's got to get away from the idea that virtues and vices structure the theory. What, con what structures a moral theory is consequences of actions. So the whole Benthamite story is brought in to solve these problems. Don't think about virtues and vices at all. I mean, that way, mm. this difficulty <coughs> cannot be ironed out. Mm. That's just the wrong structure of a moral theory. So this has haunted um, Western moral philosophy, which is the thought that if there are evaluative descriptive terms, as Thucydides originally calls them, mm. then maybe there's no solution. And what you beautifully point out, which I tried to show in the Shakespearean case, any playwright, of course, loves the idea of inu tranquil partem mm. because that's parts and collision of parts and debate. Mm. So that's the stuff of drama. Mm. But that there might just not be an answer. Mm. And that, I think, is what's amazing about Coriolanus. So that the people think he's disgustingly haughty and proud. Menenus, Menenius tries to say to them, no, he's noble and magnanimous. Mm. Um, the... the uh, uh, the tribunes, of course, are completely clear that he's simply haughty and proud. Uh, the people can't make up their minds. Alphidius <laughs> thinks he's both. Finally, Alphidius murders him on the grounds of his haughtiness and intolerable pride and immediately says he was the noblest man. Yeah. And the play ends yeah. on, at that moment. And so the entire play could be seen as a juxtaposing of mm. these two views with no implication that there's an answer. Mm. Thank you. I want to move on to Hobbes now, oh, um, right. who you yes. mentioned. So, so he is a major figure in the book and um, reappears um, throughout. Um, and one of the themes that you're interested um, in exploring is his account of political representation and sovereignty, his sort of radical account. But of course, you're interested in contextualizing that account in the context of the debates of um, the 1640s. And I wonder if you might sketch the drama of that debate. That's to say what it is that is so infuriating Hobbes mm. and um, what he replies. Oh, well, that's, that's a tall order. That's that is wonderful. a tall order. No, that's lovely. I'll have a go. Um, he says at the very beginning, I'm trying to pass between the points of two sides unwounded. And yeah. so the, the image of the duel, and he's going to move between the two. And one calls for too much authority, that's to say the divine right of kings, which thinks that sovereignty is given by God. That's too much authority. And one asks for too much freedom by saying that sovereignty is a property of the people. Hobbes wants to say, amazingly, sovereignty is not a property of the sovereign, and it's not a property of the people. Yeah. So neither government nor the government is the owner of sovereignty. So where does it lie? Mm. And the answer is, it has to lie in a fiction. It cannot lie with any group of these people. So then, of course, the question is, well, how could that be? And that generates Hobbes' analysis of the political covenant. So the political covenant is simply a multitude realizing that for its own peace and benefit, um, it must will away its rights, authorize someone to speak and act in its name. But the act of that authorization, whereby we all agree to will away our rights to a representative who now speaks in our name, makes us a person. Because we now have a single will and voice, that's to say, the voice of our representative, and so we can act. But if you have a voice which is singular and you can act, then you are a person. That's what Hobbes means by a person. It's anyone who can have actions attributed to them. So now the multitude can have actions attributed to it in the light of their being, the actions of their representative. 
So then for Hobbes, the question is, well, who does that representative represent? It can't represent the multitude because they have multiple wills. It can only represent the person of the multitude. Mm. That is the state. Mm. So there emerges this idea of the state as a fictive person mm. represented by a sovereign. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it struck me as very odd, in a way, as I was reading. So there's, there, you absolutely brilliantly bring out the extent to which Hobbes invests a lot in this person by fiction, the person of the state. Mm. And it struck me as so odd in this sense that, you know, when I read Hobbes as so often dismissive of fiction. So, you know, if you think about your own oh, yeah. analysis of liberty in the proper signification, you know, he's not interested in liberty except insofar as that which is predicated on bodies. You know, you're yeah. free if you're um, not stopped from moving just as a river is free unless it's dammed. Um, and, yeah. you know, so, and also, of course, he goes against um, the parliamentarian's account of the body of the people as another kind of, of fiction. Definitely. And yet he then wants to propose this remarkable kind of act of imagination. Yes. Well, that's an extremely good point. I think, yes. The answer to it is that he likes to distinguish fictions of the imagination from fictions of the law. Ah. Fictions of the imagination um, are things like the ancients believing in the gods of the heathen. Um, they imagine the gods of the heathen. They don't actually exist at all. Um, but it's perfectly easy to imagine them, and then you could imagine Fortune, you could imagine her as a powerful goddess, mm. you could actually create a temple mm. to Fortune, you could mm. worship her. That's all absolute nonsense. Mm. That's just the imagination mm. at work. Contrast that with fictions of the law, where Hobbes has the very strong Roman law instinct, which the English common law has never had. And of course it was Maitland's great grouse against English common law that it was hopeless about the notion of a legal fiction. It did everything by precedent, but we have to have fictions. Unfortunately, instead of having a theory of legal fictions, as, ben, as he's also fond of pointed out, we got Bentham, the attack <laughs> on fictions, the insistence yeah. that law has to be about facts, and facts can only be about pleasure and pain, that kind of appalling crudification of the legal tradition and the Anglophone tradition. And, and even Maitland didn't succeed in resuscitating the idea of legal fictions as central to our legal theory. But there it is in Hobbes, Corporations have got to be able to speak, mm. but they're just a fiction. How can a fiction speak? Uh, and a state is just a fiction, but how can a state speak? And the answer is, the magical answer is, by representation. Because attributed yes. actions are actions. And if there is someone who is authorised to speak in the name of a corporation, then the, speak, the, the speaking of that person is attributed to the organisation and counts as the speaking and acting of that corporation although the corporation is a pure fiction. So representation does it all. But notice, as you rightly say, the attack on the parliamentarian theory of representation, which is roughly the theory we've inherited, which we call virtual representation, mm. namely that the right metaphor for representation is, takes, well, of course, from antiquity, it comes from painting and the visual arts generally. So it's having a good representation of, meaning a picture of, of course, Hobbes hates that idea because that means that a representation of the body of the people will itself have to be the body of the people, which we believe, we think Parliament represents the people. Hobbes says that's all superstition. Representation is just authorising someone. You can authorise anyone. A woman can speak for a man, the young can speak for the old. It, there's no problem about that, so long as they've been authorised. Hmm. So you get a completely different model, theatrical, hmm. rather than from the visual arts. Hmm. Because what representation is, is somebody speaking your lines. And that, of course, is entirely taken from Cicero, um, as opposed to the story which comes out of um, Roman aesthetics, you know, it ut pictura poesis, that it's all about picturing. Hobbes is saying it's nothing to do with picturing. That's like the great mistake Lord Cornbury made. Do you know the story of Lord Cornbury? He was um, colonial governor of New Jersey under Queen Anne. And because he was representing a woman, he thought he had to make all public appearances <laughs> in female dress. And Hobbes is the theorist who tells you where Lord Cornbury has gone wrong. <laughs> representing Queen Anne doesn't mean you have to look like Queen Anne. It just means Queen Anne has authorised you to speak in her name. So it's a powerful thought. Yes. I think we should all dress as Queen Anne. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, I want to actually, well, I want to know more about that, but maybe we can talk about that in drinks, because I want, we have to move on, and we have to move on, I think, finally, to talk about method. Oh, okay. Um, because it struck me, um, 
in this book? Um, well, there are two things that I think I want to ask. Um, one is that you reiterate um, in this book an old claim of yours, which is, and I'm quoting, that you're skeptical about the project of writing histories of concepts. Um, but is it not the case, to some extent, that what you're doing here and what you have been doing is writing a history of, for example, the belief that um, you are unfree if you are dependent on the will of another, mm. or that the state ought to be sovereign as opposed to the government. Mm. I see, yes. Well, maybe I expressed the doubt wrongly. My scepticism about writing the history of, the concept, of a concept um, relates closely to the two essays that you refer to there. Uh, my point in both those essays, and the reason why I adopt a more genealogical approach, which I stole in the 1970s as a way of thinking from my friend Raymond Goyce, um, is that what genealogy is there to help you see, in the case of at least a large range of our concepts, is that there is no concept to which a particular term has, abs has absolutely clear reference. So there is no history to be written of the concept. What there would be a history to be written of is different ways in which the verbal expression of that concept has been put to use. So if you now think about that in relation to liberty, the term has been used to express the concept of self-mastery, but also the concept of non-interference, as you say, but also the concept of non-dependence. There is no one concept that the term has ever been agreed to express. So you, there's no history of the concept no. to be written. But there might be a history of, nor of a normative proposition, the kind of normative proposition that you're yes, sympathetic good. to. There would. In that case, what you'd be writing would be the history of the verbal expression of the concept in argument. It would be part of an argument, and you'd be talking about how this concept is verbalized and for what motivations and mm. for what purposes. Mm. But there would not be the Kosoleckian project no. of writing uh, the history of the state from Aristotle to, I mean, no. what? <laughs> I mean, you have to be attentive to language and Aristotle was writing in Greek and I mean, yes. it's all too obvious. I think. Yes. Um, so following on then from, from that point, um, my second related thought, it, is to do with the kind of normative project, um, your normative mm, project, mm. if there is one. So you have never denied that you are, that you think it's possible and that you are indeed interested in evaluating the propositions that you excavate in these debates that you're talking about. And I wonder, it felt to me in this book that you come out kind of even more unabashed about this oh, um, project. And, and yeah. I was wondering, which I think is a good thing, and I was wondering if you felt bolder um, in that context. Oh, how interesting. Context. <laughs> yes, the recklessness of old age. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, to think of yourself as a sort of, as a, no, you know, making normative claims. Yes. Well, look, I, I would think that I would cleave always to the view that the task of the intellectual historian is to try to reconstitute these arguments so far as possible on their own terms and try to understand how they saw the particular concept I'm talking about. So, for example, to take the case of liberty, they weren't thinking about it except Hobbes, in the 17th century at all, as we would in general be thinking about it now. Um, I mean, there are more than two concepts in liberty. I can think of four straight away, so to speak. So I, I wanted to say, let's resurrect these, um, these debates and try to see what's going on mm. inside them. Now, my original motivation for that, in the work that I tried to write about method in the 1960s, was to denature our concepts which was to say, look, this is in a way liberating. Of course, I was writing at the same time as Foucault, although I wasn't aware of him. I don't think he was aware of me either. Um, <laughs> but I was saying something similar, which is that there's something liberating about the thought that we're one tribe amongst others and that our concepts are our concepts. Mm. They're what we mm. bring to the world to mm. make sense of the world. Mm. And they could be very different in other circumstances. Mm. So that's the story about our concepts. Mm. However, it is true to say, if I reflect on what you've just put to me, that the more I've done this historical work, the more I've seen that there are very interesting cases of paths that got closed off or ways that were not taken. Mm. And my interest in the theory of freedom stems from my seeing that there was a path that was not taken that got closed off where it might have been much more fruitful for us for that path not to have been closed off. Mm. 
Mm. So there's an absolutely outright normative claim mm. that I want to make about the loss of a particular way of thinking about it. And I think the loss of that way of thinking about freedom, just as I think the loss of the fictionality of the state and the fact that although every newspaper talks about the state, they just mean the government. Mm. These are actual moral losses as well as conceptual losses. And I've become much more interested in pursuing those. Thank you. Now, we are almost out of time, but I'm going to put one question um, to you, and then um, all your friends can um, come and talk to you um, over drinks. Um, but so one of your essays, the last, my last question is, that one of your um, essays concerns laughter. Indeed. And as someone who likes to laugh a lot, <laughs> I'm very anxious at the thought that laughter might only be thought of as a sign of contempt, which yes. is the way in which it's presented in your book. Yeah, very good. Okay. So help well, me out here. Very good. Well, I, I'll say a word about that essay. It's called Hobbes and Civil Conversation. I'm interested in, in Civili Conversazione, in there, but it's a polemical piece because although there's been wonderful work done on the phenomenon of laughter and its connection with derision, uh, and of course in Latin, you know, quintilian, readery, est deridere, mm. they don't really distinguish even at the level of the language between those two functions. Um, that has been seen, I think, largely owing to Bakhtin's great work in Saturnalian terms, that the function of laughter is the derision of the ruling class. I tried to write a piece in which I wanted to say it's also a way for the ruling class to police the boundaries of that class, because there's particular ways which will mm. be derided because you haven't measured up to mm. being a member of the elite. So that was what I was trying to look at mm. and tracing it through, essentially, from Castiglione's picking up of Cicero's discussion and then following that through. Um, so, yes, they all think that laughter is inherently satirical and they live in circumstances in which they see huge competition between people so that you're always trying to get the better of these people. This is, of course, preeminently Hobbes. And one way is to be able to laugh at them and you would be seeking to do that. So, the, the, we, we don't have the word in English, but the Freude, the joy here, is always schadenfreude. Mm. Um, now, that is very strange that both Descartes and Hobbes should revive that idea in the 17th century, because if they'd known about all the critique of Aristotle, who, of course, in the rhetoric is someone who promotes this notion, if they'd looked at all the 16th century discussions, of, the very sceptical discussions of Aristotle's rhetoric, they would have seen this view cancelled. And my favourite cancellation, so here I'll end, is the great Fracastorio in De Sympatia, which is... I suppose best known because it was the first work to discuss syphilis, but it has many remarkable things in it about sympathy and antipathy, and one of them is a chapter on laughter. And he says, well, I'm a doctor, and I'm very surprised at this idea that laughter is only derision, because I see lots of babies, <laughs> and babies laugh all the time, but I do not believe that they are in competition for glory with other babies. <laughs> And this comes out, best of all, in Joubert, and again, it's so interesting we don't have this in English, is that, of course, laughter always expresses Freude, it's always joy, but there's something called pure joie de vivre, and that's what babies have. So that's what you <laughs> have, too. <laughs> I think that's what I have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that seems like a very appropriate um, note on which to end. Um, let us thank Quentin for his talk and for his book, and let's all go and drink. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>